So I, I wish to welcome everyone to the African Tea Time series. We are very excited to have everyone here. Uh, it's uh, yeah, four or uh, four. We're especially excited to see our two alums, Paolo and Dr. Mark, that are going to be facilitating the, the discussion today. We, we're really honored that you are able to spare some time out of your busy afternoons to, to be here to have this discussion with us. And we really appreciate the, the, the audience that has joined already. We want you to feel welcome and we hope that you're going to enjoy the discussion and please feel free to ask questions after the discussions. And also you can add your questions in the chat, your comments, and let's make it a discussion. Let's make it more lively than a webinar. We, we make it a meeting for a reason. We, we usually, those who are, have been at MSU, we, we meet in a room where we have snacks at the back. We have lovely conversations. We have people hugging one another, but we can't do it online. But we really try to make it as fun as we can, as, as well as an educative uh, session. So we really feel that uh, we're happy that you're here. And we hope that we are going to have a, a fascinating and uh, educative discussion as well. So at this time, I want to introduce the speakers for the day. And uh, the first presentation is going to be based on Angola. And uh, the speaker, I'm pulling up my, the speaker is, uh, Paolo, I call, Luta, Lut, tell me you, how you pronounce for the last time, Paolo, please tell me how you pronounce your first name. Sure. Uh, most people have challenges with, with my first name. Uh, that's the, the entire reason I go by Paolo. Uh, Luntadila is the first name. Luntadila. 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 Correct. Awesome. Thank you. There sir. we go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I really want to learn it for the first time. I'll, I'll write it in my first language so I don't forget it again. Lunta Dila Paolo will be uh, doing the presentation and, and uh, he graduated uh, in 2018. Paolo, am I right? From MSU. And currently he's working with as an audit and assurance associate with the uh, co con Connick company, I perhaps even pronouncing it wrong, but he's here. To, uh -huh. Yes, sure. He's here to discuss about China's influence on the Angolan economy. And then next after Lutandila, we're going to have Dr. Tara Mok. And Dr. Tara Mok is assistant professor, honors college, the University of Alabama. And uh, he is also going to, she's also going to base his discussion on what's the China relationship in the country of the Gambia. I don't want to go so much into the details of their discussion. We're going to hear from them, but I, I'd like you to join me to welcome both of them. And at this moment, I want to give it to uh, Paolo to begin the discussion. Please, Paolo, feel welcome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank, thank you. I, I do appreciate the, the introduction. Um, in, in Angola, we have a saying that translate, translated states, good children always return home. And, and I feel happy to be home. And it's a privilege to, to talk with so uh, many knowledgeable experts, uh, driven people in, in, in African studies. Uh, I, I enjoy the time at Michigan State. I, I love the relationship with uh, the people, in, in, with some of the people in, in the call that I had the opportunity to establish. And, and by the way, happy uh, Women's Month, happy Women's Day that, that just passed to all the women in the call today. So uh, I am excited to, to be connecting in, in this amazing month. Um, be, before I, I started, I just want to get a sense, uh, this is a conversation about how much people have interest invested in Chinese relationship uh, in Africa. A anyone has done any research, read any, um, except Tara Mock, of course, she, has, she is presenting on this subject today. Anyone has uh, done any work on Chinese influence across Africa before? Feel free to, to, to join in. Any, 
any comments, any message, you can unmute yourself and, and comment if you'd like. Okay, the, the silence tells me no. Yeah, let me, let me unmute myself. Uh, I haven't <laughs> research, but you know, I just know that China has been influential in shaping part of, uh, well, broadly speaking, um, African economy in many countries around the world. So I'm interested to see um, what you will say about Angola and the next presentation about Gambia. I've seen it um, firsthand there. So yeah, that, that's my two cents for you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Alexis. Uh, thanks for the comment. Uh, any one last comments before we, we move? Okay, so, well, the, the, the general understanding, at least for most of us, is that uh, China has become a major global power and has extensive influence in many parts of the world. And my goal with this presentation is to add a little bit in our common knowledge into how much influence actually China has in the Angolan economy and how this influence reflects in, in the way Angola does, it, it develops, not only has developed in the last uh, 20 years and moving forward. So the way that, that I organized today's uh, conversation, I broke it down into five parts where I, I, I want to give us a little bit of the background into the the Angolan uh, China relationship before independence. From my conversation with people in the continent, here in the United States and, and other friends across the world, there is this an idea that China became uh, influential in the continent in, in the past uh, in the past one decade or so, or at least in the Angolan case. Uh, after the end of the civil war. But there is a lot more information that we, we missed about Chinese involvement even during the, the period of uh, decolonization of many African countries. So I'm gonna kind of build uh, the, the conversation from there and then move into how Angola's law for Chinese money might have played uh, either in, in, in Angola's ability to, to develop itself or not so much to develop itself, depending on what uh, people are considering development to be. After that, we'll touch briefly on uh, how uh, the, the increasing amount of debt in, in Angola created uh, room for some of the, uh, the, the member of the government to mismanage the fund and the role of China in cover up that um, substantial plunder of the treasury. And I will conclude today's conversation with some ideas in regards to uh, who are the, the potential losers and who are the potential winners in this relationship and what is next for Angola. So when we look into uh, the historical relationship between uh, China and the United States, we really have to go back to where the country today we know as Angola began. China's involvement in Angola began at a time that we did not have a country called Angola. We were a, a colony of Portugal as some of us or ideally all of us know. Um, and it, it was around the 1950s, 1960s, that the, 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 the Angolan, to the, what we consider today Angola, the indigenous people in Angola and the elite in the capital city of Luanda saw that across the continent, many nations were becoming independent, right. gaining independence. And that led, um, that some of the, 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 excuse me, sorry. I think I was hearing yeah, some something. feedback. <laughs> uh, so what, what took place is that it, at, at the 1950s and 19, 1960s, the elite in the capital city of Luanda 
had founded the popular movement for the liberation of Angola. This was an elite class made of mestizos or the, the mixed uh, descendants of the local indigenous people and the Portuguese. They were educated and their approach to revolution was much different to the FNLA, which was a movement formed mainly by the indigenous people from the Bakongo tribe, which oddly I am a descendant from. Um, the, these two movements were really favorable by the, the, the Chinese government at the time. And the, the Chinese involvement to, to support these revolutionary movements was mainly in form of light training, military capacitation, and in very few cases, it involved substantial uh, inflows of, of money. And these two organizations had a different approach to their revolutionary fight. And the FNLA, which was mainly made up of indigenous, broke in half where the UNITA was born, which stands for the National Union for the Total Independence of Angola, which was mainly formed by a mix of indigenous people and also the elite um, from the capital. And from, from, from there, all of the three uh, revolutionary movement was trying to get attentions of international uh, players to support them in their fight for independence against Portugal. The MPLA was very fortunate to attract the attention of the, the Soviet Union and the Cuban, but also was dancing around with the Americans. UNITA, on the other hand, and the FNLA saw that as a, an incentive for them to pursue relationship with China. And if we can put this into context, we will see that around 1960, China itself was go undergoing a cultural revolution led by Mao Zedong that, that, that pushed China in a way to sympathize with revolutionary movements across Africa and Latin America as well. And Mao Zedong pushed its government to provide much more training to the UNITA revolutionary movement, a lot of media coverage to allow them to have a good standing. But as the relationship uh, between UNITA and China moved forward, as we get close to the Angolan independence at 1975, China found it better to, to take a step back to see who would become the, the head of uh, this independence movement because uh, for, for each foreign policy perspective, it didn't make sense to support a, a specific party. And if this party loses uh, for, for the independence as it came to happen, they wouldn't have a good diplomatic relationship. And exactly their war sphere came to happen, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on the size, uh, the side we take. And as a, as a result of that, close to 19, 1975, early in the year, the three, polit the three movements that were negotiating with the Portuguese to leave the territory of Angola were, had began fighting for their own legitimacy. In, in the first place, they wanted to be recognized by the Angolan people as the, the main political party that led the country to independence. But on the, second, on, the, on the second level, they also wanted to be legitimate and recognized by the organization of the African Union. And after that, to the international uh, organization as well. Unfortunately, many mistakes happened throughout this time. Not only China took a step back in its relationship with these three movements, not providing them training or um, military personnel or, or assistance, but it opened the door for the Soviet Union 
to continue to increase even at a higher level their support and commitment to the MPLA. The MPLA saw that as an opportunity to, some people would say, to start the civil war, but other people would say the, the UNITA and FNLA actually were the one who started the civil war by inviting South Africa to, to the war because before the independence, South Africa had invaded the south of Angola trying to push it forward. And as a result of that, we don't really know for sure how the civil war started. started. The only thing we know is that both sides are on, on the equation were trying to be the legitimate political party that led the country to independence. And as we celebrate, we went to celebrate independence in, 19, in 1975, November 11, Angola was already officially in a violent civil war. And all these three political parties started fighting each other that escalated to the level of internationalization of the, of the war where South Africa was involved, the United States had CIA agent, the Soviet Union had the KGB in place, and the Cuban had the, 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 their sole military presence, including Che Guevara, and so, at some point had to come to Angola to help train the MPLA and move the, the war in favor of the MPLA. And throughout this time, the 1970s, to independence after uh, independence, China was really taking uh, a step back and its main contribution to the Angolan civil war was a, a vocal uh, condemnation of the Soviet Union, the, 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 the Cuban Republic and South Africa for undermining a democracy in Angola for what the Chinese believed was an invasion and the, the fact that they removed the, 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 the authority of the Angolan people and imposed the MPLA government on them. And in the, in the midst of the 19, 1980s, China moved its position in regards to uh, the MPLA movement, mainly because China was becoming a growing country in terms of its economic power and the need for energy to boost its economy. And Angola was one of these places that had substantial reserves of uh, crude oil, natural gas that was still untapped. And while China was trying to reposition its strategy and foreign policy in regards to Angola, the United States already had made substantial steps inside the government, the Angolan government, by developing, excuse me, diplomatic relationship with the government in place, allowing West uh, American corporation to start exploration of uh, oil and gas and so forth. By the time we reached the second, uh, by the time we reached 2002, the end of civil war in Angola, China and, 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 and Angola were still working towards a path to develop several diplomatic and, and economic relationship that allowed them to immediately after the civil war for China to invest massively in Angola's infrastructure reconstruction. After the civil war, the, the Angolan government tried to uh, reach out to the international community to see if there was viable investors or organization that could sponsor the national reconstruction program. But unfortunately, the IMF and the World Bank found, thought that Angola was too risky to start investment. The only level of, uh, uh, of assistance they were willing to provide at the time was technical assistance, which Angola didn't find really important at the time. So they went with the Chinese and China came in, in big way. Their first loan was 
around a hundred million dollar. And then they expanded their, their commitment with two billion oil backed loan to the Angolan government. And this loan, fortunately or unfortunately, allowed Angola to invest substantially in its infrastructure in whatever was destroyed through the 27 plus years of civil war. And not only that, it allowed Angola to move from a, a broken state to a state that was uh, becoming more and more relevant to, to the global, to the African continent and the global stage. By the time we reached 2000, uh, 2000, 2017, Angola was the largest debt holder, uh, Chinese debt holder in Africa. Not only that, Angola was the first, the number one supplier of oil to China in Africa and number four in the world. Both economies were so deeply uh, dependent on each other for different reasons. Angola for development, for infrastructure, and China, on the other hand, for energy dependency. And this relationship continued up until the financial crisis in Angola in 2014, which I will touch on briefly soon. But what the Chinese money allowed Angola to do has been a miraculous transformation. Angola rose from number 23 economy in Africa to number five by the year 2013. And it maintained an average growth rate of 13.5% per year between 20, 2005 and 2013. And work in, in, in managing its inflation, we had a substantial decline in inflation between 2002 and 2010. And also we increased our oil production from 700,000 a day to 1.3. Uh, barrel per day, yeah, right. 1.3 million barrel per day. And the Angolan government used the, the debt from China to build roads across the country, hospitals and school. Uh, although there is a lot of criticism in, in the quality of this construction. But unfortunately, not everything was as great as we, we, we may think. The more China was willing to provide the Angolan government uh, financial support, the more the people in the government found opportunities to uh, steal some of this money from the treasury and divert them into their personal uh, asset. And this initially wasn't a problem until the financial crisis hit in, in, in the economy that was driven mainly by the fall in, in the oil price in, in 2013, 2014. Angola's budget saw itself slashed by at least half at the time. And the ruling elite uh, were continuously trying to get their assets outside of, the, uh, of Angola, uh, hiding them in, in, in shell company, in uh, other jurisdiction that doesn't ask many questions and, and so forth. The other factor that kind of drove the end of the party in Angola was the fact that uh, Jose Eduardo de Santos, the president at the time, was becoming very sick and he had to pay more constant visits to, to, to Spain where he resides today uh, since he left the power. And that gave space for the MPLA, the, the political party that has been in power since independence, to try to find an alternative. And they found their, their alternative, Jean Lorenzo. Another contributing factor was the growing wealth divide that drove a lot of youth in Angola to go out and protest and ask more for demand accountability from the government. By the time we, we reached 2017, China's relationship with Angola was starting to get a little bit 
but a, a little bit uh, from a position of stability to a position of uncertainty because China has dealt with Jose Eduardo dos Santos, the ex-president and his family for a long time. It was a predictable relationship. It was stable. They could control the flow and the, 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 the agreements in, in question. But the new president coming in the picture wasn't really something that uh, China was looking forward to. And what also added into these conflicting interests was the fact that the President John Lorenzo, we call him J-Lo, he vocally made it as, as its effort to fight corruption in Angola. Whether or not he's fighting corruption, it, it's a question we'll have to answer in a few years down the road but also the fight for corruption led to a, a, a war inside the MPLA because to prosecute people who, who have plundered the country, you have to prosecute the majority of people in, in the leadership of the MPLA. And by the time we, we were nearing the end of 2019, the COVID-19 pandemic began, even though in Angola, it, it doesn't even seem like the pandemic is happening or anything, but the Angolan economy continues to suffer significantly because of, as a result of it, because of it, uh, because of the impact the pandemic has on Angola's key partners, uh, whether it's China, the United States, Portugal, Spain, and France, and and to add into, into the uncertainty in, in Angola's relationship with, with China, uh, about 3 billion to 5 billion of Chinese loan was due last year, but Angola had to renegotiate uh, the, the repayment because the country doesn't have money. And moving into 2021, 20, uh, not only Angola, but many African countries are in the process, as we speak, of trying to renegotiate their uh, sovereign debt. Whether they will be successful, it's still to be uh, determined. But from where I, I see things moving, I believe that they probably will be successful to renegotiate the debt. But what Africans should be concerned about is not the renegotiation itself but the terms of this renegotiation, because Angola has pledged already a substantial amount of its oil reserve to China and moving forward, uh, we don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, the PwC mega trend report, for example, in 2015 projected that in the next 20 to 50 years, uh, most instability in the world is going to be created by uh, natural resources. Whoever controls the resources is the one who will, uh, most people will be targeting. And the African continent controls substantial amount of natural resources. And Angola has a significant debt to, to China, about 20, 21 billion as of December, 2020. And about 50% of the na national budget today in Angola goes to cover uh, debt repayment. So what Angola is moving into is a very unpredictable situation with China. And often we see, for example, as a result of the corruption fight, uh, news like this more, at least once a week, prosecution of, of a high bidder in high official in the Angolan government or a family or a friend of the former president and so forth. Um, and the, the, the last point that I'd like to touch on really briefly is in terms of the, the winners and losers in, in the relationship between China and Angola. Uh, for the losing part, the losing side in this relationship, definitely the Angolan people. Uh, the amount of debt the Angolan economy accumulated 
unfortunately didn't benefit most uh, Angolans, even though these uh, debts allowed the economy to build infrastructure, but it didn't provide, it, it didn't, well, I, I'm not sure if it should have, but I believe that the government did a, a good job uh, managing the debt to create uh, businesses to move, to allow private uh, actors to build businesses that could generate economic growth and sustainable employment to, to the, in the economy. Um, the winning side, one, one certain winning side has been the international corporations. Uh, American businesses, Italian businesses had a substantial presence, especially in the oil industry and, and um, energy industry. Um, the not so certain winners are the current elite in Angola who are under constant attack now um, due to the corruption campaign, but also China seems to be the winning side so far but the, the future is quite uncertain in case Angola defaults in, in its obligations, which is which may or may not happen. But um, as, as of 2020, the, the government has been trying to uh, sell a number of assets and privatize um, a number of its um, holdings and interest in many companies uh, across Angola. But the amount of capital they have raised, it's substantially, uh, substantially small compared to their financial needs. So some of the, the, the thoughts that I think the Angolan, us Angolans should consider and probably some other African countries is to forget the idea of diversification because diversification uh, of an economy may not be the answer, for example, for Angola. We don't have many strengths. Our strength is oil and maybe we should spend our resources to build that industry and capitalize on its resources to create a more sustainable uh, long-term economy. Maybe we'll still need China to continue to uh, fund our development, or maybe we won't. Uh, for example, Dangote in Nigeria, he's investing substantially in, in cement and oil exploration. It's putting a lot of money into refinery building. Maybe we should look into other partners across Africa as well, because now we have the African Free Continental Trade Agreement uh, it has been in effect since January 1st. So I believe it, it, it could be a potential channel to work with other African states to see how we can create strategic regions for uh, the development in terms of specialization, in terms of industry or region, and, and, and probably it, it could work, but it's not a definite uh, policy. The, the second aspect in, in, in what Angola is trying to do and may be able to be successful in doing is to move the, 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 the economy toward the private sector. Currently, besides debt repayment, Angola spends significant amount of its budget, about 20% of the budget goes to pay salaries of uh, it's bureaucrats and people in the public sector. And it, it's not sustainable. We can continue uh, holding the, the, the economy hostage by the government. And, and the last point that I, I would make a case for is for the Angolan government to divert some, some of the, 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 the budget toward creating, uh, toward investing in private sector than to continue subsidizing company, companies that are ill-managed because we produce oil, but we continue to import oil and subsidize oil companies in Angola. If that subsidy 
went to agriculture companies, we probably wouldn't have shortage of food. Um, so many other areas will, will need to be revisited and the national budget probably received different priority. Um, and these are some of the, the three ideas that I've seen Angola struggling with. And I, I hope that in the future, our relationship with China is going to move from um, a place of us depending substantially on, the, on China's ability to loan Angola money to a place where we can actually develop more of a trading relationship outside of the, the oil industry. So with that, um, I, I will conclude uh, my presentation and we're open for any contribution. Oh. Well, thank you so much, Paolo, for this very fascinating and balanced analysis, in my opinion, on the relationship between China and, and, and Angola. And uh, briefly, I want to know if Eben, are you here? Eben was the facilitator for today and his internet has not been working well. I was just wondering if he's back so he can continue, but if not, I can just go ahead and, and continue. It, do, it doesn't, I think he's here, but then I think the internet is still having issues. So um, before I, I see a few, a couple of questions on the chat, but before we go into that, I mean, um, it's, it's fascinating to see this historical perspective that you've given on how uh, Angola and China have been, what I could say have been collaborating if I would call it that, whether we want to call it a collaboration or, but, um, and as you kept uh, uh, opening it up more, it does seem to me like um, somehow it's supposed to be a productive relationship, but then uh, the elite or the leadership in itself has kind of failed the country, the civilians in trying to make this relationship, for example, fair. So as you said, the, 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 the country in itself doesn't benefit the civilians. Maybe the, in the, the infrastructure part, it seems to be working, but then it doesn't profit the people themselves. This relationship, however imbalanced it is, it doesn't seem to benefit the people. So in your um, opinion or in your observation, do you think that uh, going forward, the relationship might be more beneficial if perhaps the, the government or the leadership, the Angolan leadership participated or, or, or acted responsibly in this relationship, what do you think? It's, it's somehow, it, it, it feels to me that um, it's not as skewed as it is in other parts of, uh, of, of, of Africa, but then still there the are lots of failures, especially knowing that if you have a relationship and the people that are benefiting are not the, 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 the civilians of that country. It doesn't benefit infrastructure by itself. It, it can't benefit the, the country per se. So basically what I'm asking is that, uh, what do you think would make this relationship or this partnership one fair and two beneficial to not just the elites, but to the civilians themselves? It's, it's quite different to really pinpoint uh, mm -hmm. maybe strategies or, or, or policy that could help um, the, 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 the Chinese and Angolan relationship to benefit the, the rest of the population. We often talk about uh, fighting corruption across the, the continent of Africa, but uh, the, the African Union has um, a Council on Anti-Corruption Practices, but we don't really have enforcing mechanism. African governments don't know how to hold each other accountable, if, if I can say that. Um, in, in Angola, for example, it, it's really tricky because maybe if we had um, a balance of power in a way mm -hmm. that could probably be the, 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 the first step because we have an, a, an opposition that 
not only lost the, the civil war, but also isn't really doing its job as an opposition. Very often uh, the, the parliament doesn't hold the executive branch accountable, neither the judicial uh, branch of the government. We, 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 we are in a situation where even if we try to hold them accountable, there isn't enough of a system of, for example, audit. So let me give an example. The United States Department of, Def of Defense is audited every year. Every branch of the government of, in the United States get audit every year. And the audit is done by a special area in department in the, in the United States government that is responsible for auditing every single organization that is completely independent of every branch of the government. Africa, South Africa is one of the very few African countries that has a similar department. If you look into the annual reports produced by the finance ministry in Angola, the National Bank of Angola, the audit is done by foreign companies that have very much an incentive to not provide a high quality audit because that's where their fees come from. So to begin, it, it's already an entirely flawed place to begin. We don't have enforcing mechanism. We don't have qualified people to do the, the, the enforcing, to understand the implication that what uh, some people's decision making will have on the economy. And, and some of the few who get the opportunity to uh, go study in France, in Moscow or, or China or Beijing, when they come back to Angola, they already are indoctrinated by the MPLA philosophy. So the system keeps perpetuating. Mm -hmm. um, so honestly, I, I don't mean to sound as if there is no hope but I, I think it's really difficult to provide an answer that would even attempt to, to, to uh, give us a little bit of hope. I, I definitely know, and, and the case of, of Angola, it's not just um, Angola, as you know, it's, it's a case of many other African countries. So mm -hmm. the fact that we sometimes don't have solutions to these problems, doesn't mean that it's not important to keep highlighting them because there are issues that are amongst us, amongst our countries in our continent. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's important that we raise them and with the hope that um, as we discuss, maybe we are all enlightened mm -hmm. and, and solutions are going to come from amongst ourselves. So thank you for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And I see a question here from Max in saying that what, what presence does the US have in Angola? And then what more would the US do, if anything? Wow, <laughs> uh, th that's an, an interesting question. Um, the, the US, before China came in, in full fledged to the picture in Angola, the US was one of the largest trading partners of Angola, uh, was one of the largest buyers of Angolan oil. And even today, most of the company that do uh, oil, oil exploration and distribution in Angola are still largely American businesses. So the, the United States government at any cost protects its own interest in, in Angola. Uh, one of the, the, the key area Angola has been, hold, uh, excuse me, the US have helped Angola uh, control for a long time is the is Cabinda. Cabinda is in a region slightly detached. It's separated by um, a region of the DRC in the north of Angola. 
if, if it wasn't for the United States uh, intervention, like that. that part of the country would have become independent very long time ago. Uh, the United States keeps Cabinda under the Angolan government exactly because it provides the United States access to cheap oil, uh, regardless uh, in, in terms of trade, the, the Angolan government it is in a way protected by the United States. Uh, the, the previous uh, president was a mastermind in playing Russia against the United States and having each other be, uh, bid against one another to have control of certain uh, resources. In terms of what it can do uh, to help fight corruption in Angola, absolutely nothing. Because the United States is one of the biggest creators of corruption in Angola. Uh, high officials of the Angolan government managed to siphon and hide assets outside of Angola because of the United States. Uh, if you look into Luanda's leak, you'll see the president's, the former president's daughter, she was the, the wealthiest woman in Africa, amassing more than 3 billion in net asset. And a lot of that was controlled, was kept in the United States. Uh, United States businesses, uh, banks, uh, insurance company, consulting firms, accounting firms, help Angolan elite cover up, even manage to steal money uh, you, you know, take money outside of the country to Switzerland, to, you know, Hong Kong, to Monaco, whatever, you know, has a jurisdiction with, you know, close your eyes attitude and let it go. So when you say what the United States can go is to get serious and talk less and actually act in what they have written in their anti-corruption act and anti-money laundering act. Uh, so, well, let's just keep it short there. All right. Uh, I hope Max in, uh, has got the, the response. And then one last question on the chat, and then I few, give a few more minutes for anyone who wants to unmute and, and comment or ask a question to go ahead before we move on to the next speaker. Uh, it says, given that China is the winner and Angola the loser in the current and past relationships between the two countries, what should happen to promote Angola to the winner position? I know you've kind of spoken into that, but perhaps if you mm -hmm. have any more comments on it. Hmm. That's a tough call to make. Um, generally speaking, com countries operate in a self-interest basis. China is not going to say, hi, we have, you know, done enough deals that benefit China. Let's try to do some deals that will benefit Angola now moving forward. I don't see that happening. Maybe in my dreams, it, it's going to happen. But it, it, in Angola's uh, position, I think it will come down to invest in research and the education of its people first. Um, when we invest in people, when we have educated people, uh, the oppress any oppressor have a hard time to contain a people that is educated. There is, we see it everywhere across the world. So. Uh, not that I'm saying China is oppressing Angola, maybe or maybe not, but the bottom line is we have to start with educating our people, even China itself, to become the leading one of, well, China is soon going to become the number one economy in the world, but to get to the second largest economy in the world today, China had to train its people, had to invest billions of billions of dollars in its people, education, training, research. Mm -hmm. And that's not something uh, Angola or many African government 
is currently doing. Uh, if you look into the Angolan budget for education, the amount allocated for education, it's 6%. Even though it's higher than the United States, but 6% of $80 billion, even the stimulus check of, of, the, of the, the, that the United government allocated in the last bill was more than 200 billion just to give free money to people. Like, we're not really uh, investing enough into our people. We're not. And when we do provide scholarship for people to go to school, it's usually uh, the children of the elite, uh, their friends and family. And, and we can't sit at the table, negotiate with China when we can't evaluate our natural resources. Uh, let me give you one last example and, and, and conclude. Right now in the United States or Canada or some uh, markets in Europe, there is a special vehicle to raise capital called special purpose acquisition company. Basically a group of people come together and sell stocks of a company that doesn't exist yet. And they raise hundreds of millions of dollars. And they use that money to go anywhere in the world and buy company and they take them public. African governments are not able to raise capital despite the amount of natural resources they have. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Why? Because we don't have the knowledge. We don't have the information. So my encouragement is that uh, at least the people in my generation will read a little bit more will look into uh, other parts of the world and learn what has been working. Maybe not to automatically do copy paste, but especially to think what, how did it work for them? How can we uh, do something better based on what they already did? China does it all the time, steals every single technology from the US, from Europe and does it better. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Paolo. I always say that uh, Africa is in better hands with, with people like Paolo and your generation, as you say. And I don't think I'm wrong. So um, the very last question, I, I, I see Anne's end up. So please, Anne, if you can ask your question briefly, and, and Lieutenant Dila Paolo, if you can respond to that, and then we move on to the next presenter, please. Anne. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Paolo, for an informa informative presentation. And those were great slides. Um, so I'll go on to my question. One of the criticisms of the Sino Angola development or uh, partnership has been the ghost cities outside Rwanda. So I'd like you to speak to what drove to the building of those cities and whether they served any purpose. And what has been the way forward ar around those cities? Thank you, Anne, for your question. <laughs> that, that's a dilemma that we're still trying to figure out how to solve. Um, Angola, after the independent, after, excuse me, the civil war, had a, a big problem with housing. Uh, a, a lot of things were destroyed and people needed houses to live. But the, the problem is when we try to replicate European models in the continent without taking into account certain things like purchases, purchasing power of the population. You can't build a $60,000 house and put it in Luanda where the, 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 the annual income of the resident, it's below $2,000 a year. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. And, and that was one of the many factors uh, where the Angolan government made a mistake. They could have worked with uh, other companies that 
develop affordable housing that can build houses at a cheaper cost, at much lower cost than the Chinese had built. Um, and a lot of these houses were developed in areas that were farther away from the city of Luanda. Um, and Luanda, like Luanda for a long time was the center of Angola. If you ever wanted to find a job, you needed to be in Luanda and you, you couldn't afford living, you know, uh, more than 10 miles away from Luanda. Traffic was bad. And even for the people who had initially attempted to move to these urbanization uh, housing projects, they had to leave to come back to the city of Luanda because either they were in hospital in the area or there wasn't uh, schools in the area or market close enough for, for them actually to function uh, in society. So it comes back to planning, right? They build roads, yep. they don't put sewage. They build cities and they don't put anything that sustains life around it. <laughs> so uh, we, we have to plan better. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you so much. I, I definitely appreciate, but because of time, uh, Dr. Efion, I see your question on the chat. We'll get, delve into that. I hope you're gonna stay until the end. But for right now, I want us to move on to the second speaker. And Paolo, I know that you were to leave earlier, but if your time allows a little bit, you can please stay for the next presentation. But thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We definitely thank you very much. appreciate this. So mm -hmm. our second speaker is Dr. Mark. I already introduced her for those who are not here. So please, Dr. Tara Mark, you can go ahead and share your screen and continue. Um, oh, you're muted still. The... All right, here we are. Sure. Okay, so here we are. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So thank you, Dr. Choli, for inviting me back to MSU uh, virtually, if not in the flesh. I'm glad to have the opportunity to share some of the things I've learned during my excursions to the Gambia with you today. I think um, it's only fair to start by um, disclosing my relationship to this research. I'm a scholar of Africa-China relations. Uh, I work within um, a small basket of countries around the continent, uh, but the Gambia in particular holds a special interest uh, for me, uh, given that it's a place that I've been traveling to now for 25 years. Uh, and have family members uh, who are there. Um, and so when I was asked to present uh, during African Tea Time, for me, it seemed to be a no-brainer that the Gambia would be uh, the locality that I felt most uh, comfortable speaking with in this type of venue. So with that said, I'm not certain. I know that we have at least uh, one Gambian by marriage on the chat, I don't know who else actually has some understanding of the country, but I do want to start just by providing some background information for those who are curious but don't necessarily know. So the Gambia is a small nation on the western coast of the continent of Africa. It's bordered by Senegal on three sides, uh, but it is actually uh, bordered by the Atlantic Ocean and its westernmost corner. It's also that space that made it um, a st important strategic position 
during the Atlantic trade, uh, Atlantic slave trade, um, like many of the nations along the Western coast of Africa. As you can see, it's a very small country. Um, in fact, it hosts one of the smallest populations of anywhere on the continent at just over 2 million. Uh, but despite the size of its population, it's more densely populated than the nation of Nigeria. Thus, there are a lot of people packed into this really small area. So in 1965, the Gambia uh, achieved its independence under the leadership of Dalda, Dalda Jarawa, who had served as prime minister of the nation since 1962. He later became the Gambia's first president in 1970, and he served until he was unseated by um, a military official by the name of Yaya Jama, who uh, unseated him in a bloodless coup. And Jama remained president of the Gambia um, until uh, 2016. So Jama's rule is notable for a number of reasons, um, but not the least of which was because his administration was mired in controversy uh, for much of the time that he held his position. And this was because um, he was thought to suppress the press. Um, he had withdrawn from the British Commonwealth and the International Criminal Court. And he was also uh, accused of, and more recently, uh, by virtue of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the country, found guilty in absentia of uh, human rights offenses and war crimes. So, as I mentioned, Jama remained president of the Gambia until 2016, when quite surprisingly, uh, during an election in December of that year, he was uh, displaced by a real estate developer and former security guard who had been living in the United Kingdom for a number of years uh, by the name of Adama Barrow. So Jama didn't go willingly, willingly, but ultimately there was a successful transfer of power and Barrow has been uh, president since that time. So as a former British colony, the Gambia's official language is English. But despite that, local populations also tend to use one or more of their indigenous dialects. So it's not uncommon to find someone who can speak English, but, but also Mandinka and Wolof uh, and, and or Jola or Surer. Um, so these are people who uh, uh, operate on both sides, as many people across the continent do. So it's important to the story that I'm going to tell today to have some understanding of where the Gambia lies in terms of its developmental prospects. So the economy is largely dominated by farming and fishing. So agricultural pursuits comprise roughly 70% of all the uh, employment related endeavors in the country. So most of the jobs are agriculturally based in the fishing industry and the farming industries. But despite that, those industries only uh, comprise roughly 30% of the total GDP of the nation. So where does the vast majority of Gambian GDP come from? It actually comes from the tourism industry. So on any given day on the beaches of the Gambia, you can find people from the United Kingdom, understandably, because it was a former British colony, but also Canada, Sweden, Germany, the United States, and even China, touristing in the Gambia. And touristic endeavors account for roughly 50% of the country's total GDP. So maintaining its beaches uh, and keeping them in pristine condition is important to the people of the Gambia because they understand that they're heavily reliant on those things. 
But despite the role of tourism uh, and the smaller though still significant role of these agricultural pursuits, the Gambia remained at the low end of the developmental spectrum in terms of its gross domestic product. According to the OEC now, uh, it is ranked at as one number 169th of 180 countries ranked in terms of its total GDP. But in terms of exports, it's at the bottom of all countries ranked at 180th. The total ranking is lifted slightly by the total imports, where it's ranked at 103rd. So given these figures, it shouldn't really come as any surprise that a significant portion of households in the Gambia live below the poverty level, $1.25 a day. So this is 31.6% uh, of urban households, the people who live in what we would technically consider to be urban communities, though there are not a whole lot of urban spaces in the Gambia, but also 69.5% of rural households also live below poverty. So those who work within uh, the industries in the Gambia, um, as I mentioned, they typically work within some sort of agricultural pursuit. So they are working uh, to harvest any number of the country's abundant natural resources, which include coconuts and Brazil nuts and cashews, uh, rough wood, but also fish. It's a coastal community on the Atlantic Ocean it has 80 kilometers of really pristine beaches and a significant portion of the population has relied on fishing as a way to support themselves. But in addition to that, the Gambia also boasts other uh, points of interest. So you may be familiar with Jufa Ray if you've ever seen the movie Roots uh, it was the home birthplace and homeland of Kunta Kinte, uh, which was immortalized by Alex Haley. It also boasts a number of uh, important natural attractions. So there are more than 600 species of birds, chimpanzees, colobus monkeys, but there are also increasingly eco-tourism attractions uh, focused on uh, things like crocodiles and manatees and hippos in the country. And there's also, as I mentioned, a, a surfet of saltwater aquatic varieties along its 80 kilometer coastland. And these are the real star for the Gambia. So to this, let's shift to Gambia-China relations. So I want to start just by talking a little bit about diplomatic relations between the two nations. So as I mentioned, the Gambia achieved its independence in 1965, and shortly thereafter, the Republic of China, meaning Taiwan, established diplomatic relations with the Gambia. Things went well, or presumably well enough to maintain those relations until 1974, when a shift was made to establish relations with the People's Republic of China. And if you know anything about the People's Republic of China vis-a-vis -vis its relationship with the Republic of China or Taiwan, then you may be familiar with something called the One China Policy. And under the one China policy, individuals, individual states who actually possess diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China do so with the understanding that they cannot recognize any other China. So in 1974, Gambia developed a re diplomatic relationship with the People's Republic of China, and that meant that re its relationship with Taiwan had to come to an end. That relationship continued until 1996, 
when uh, President Jama at the time determined that it was in the national interest of the country, that's his quote, to establish relations again with Taiwan. He continued to do so for a further seven years until 2013 when he became disenchanted with both options. And thus he joined a small cohort at the time, I think it was comprised of maybe five African nations that had no China policy. He was neither leaning toward the Republic of China or the People's Republic of China. And that's where things sat until 2016 when he reestablished a relationship with the People's Republic of China. And let's see what happened. So one of the most notable occurrences, because it was also and is also the most visible occurrence, is the erection of the 10-story petroleum tower. It was a China-funded uh, construction that began uh, before 2016 and actually opened, I think in 2015, 2016, I believe it is. Um, and, but it sat empty for a number of years. And so the thinking was that it was in preparation for something. It's important to note also that despite the fact that there's been a convoluted relationship between Gambia and the two Chinas. Despite that, there has been ongoing economic relations between them. They've been inconsistent, but they've remained ongoing. And thus, we find that Chinese exports to the Gambia have increased over time from $51.93 million in value in 1992 to $512 million in value as recently as 2019. When we consider Gambian exports to China, there's also an increase, but it's significantly different. So during the same time frame, 1992, Gambian exports to China were at $111,000, whereas in 2019, that number had risen to 90.1 million. So it's a significant increase, but it definitely demonstrates the inequalities in terms of the trade relationship between the two nations. And we see that the types of items that the Gambians are actually importing from China, things like cotton and footwear, uh, basic necessities, seemingly, um, electrical equipment, steel. So they're importing a diversity of items from the People's Republic of China. But the numbers of goods that are being shipped to China are far fewer than the largest export to the Gambia. So I want to Bear, I want to take a moment to focus on a specific case study that I think reflects the tenor and the tone of not only the relationship, but conversations surrounding the relationship between China and Gambia in the present moment. And I wanted to shift to a focus on a small coastal community by the name of Ganjur. So I'm focusing on Ganjur, but there are other communities in the Gambia that are um, experiencing uh, the exact same thing that I'm going to talk about, um, including Tanji, um, Kartong, and Brufut, and Bacal, and some others. So Ganjur is a, a coastal community along the uh, southwestern border of the Gambia. It's a fishing community, thus it's vitally important to uh, the economy of the Gambia because we know that fishing is important, but it's also important to the livelihoods of individual Gambians who uh, come are uh, of which fishing comprises up to 70% of its economy. So in 2016, 
the China-owned fish mill plant Golden Lead began operating out of this coastal community. And Golden Lead is merely one of these types of plants. There are currently, or as recently as 2019, when I was able to visit the Gambia last, there were three of them, uh, JXYG in Kartong and Nasim in Sanyang. So they produce what's known as fish meal. And fish meal is a derivative of fish and fish byproducts and fish waste that are ground together into pellets that are then mixed in with the feed for different animals like pigs and cattle and things of that nature. So when the deal was struck to allow this plant um, to be constructed in the Gambia, there were a number of uh, promises that were being made. And this is understandable. The thinking is that uh, by virtue of allowing this plant to be erected, that people would get jobs, that they would uh, create a, a fish market surrounding the plant. There was thinking that each member, each male member of the community would be given livestock and that they would create a road that connects the village of Gunjur with the town. But the reality is that none of those things came to pass. And that's what I want to shift to now, talking about how promises were broken regarding Gunjur and how the people of that community are left to pick up the pieces. So one of the concerns um, surrounds the issue of food insecurity. So I started off by talking about the fact that Gambian people are reliant on fish. Not only are they reliant on fish because it's their, uh, it provides them with income, but it also provides their protein. They eat what you see before you in the screen, uh, which is called bunga fish, which is commonly consumed and uh, makes up about 50% of the, the uh, meat protein that most Gambians consume in a given day. The problem is that as a result of plants like golden lead and other fish meal plants, there's been an over harvesting of the proteins. These plants are not simply using the traditional canoes that Gambians construct out of wood by hand. They're using trawlers and they are pair fishing, which means that there's one large fishing trawler, another large fishing trawler, and there's a huge net that follows behind them. And what occurs is that when that net is actually closed, it picks up everything that's on the ocean floor. And those things often become fish meal. But many of the things on the floor are things like bunga fish that people in the communities eat. And so there are growing concerns regarding how the presence of these uh, fish uh, meal processing plants are affecting food security in the Gambia. So the fish themselves are harvested, they're processed, but much of that uh, process is being removed from the people of the Gambia. It's being removed from the locals. So there were promises that they would actually employ local members of the community, and they're doing that. But what studies have found, the studies that are taking place and reports have reported, is that most of these processing plants don't employ more than 30 people. So if you're thinking about a community of more than 17,000 like Gunjur, 30 people doesn't really demonstrate a sizable um, employment record. To that is added the fact that the vast majority of fish processors in the Gambia traditionally are women. These are the women who travel to the shores of Gunjur, who travel to the shores of Tangi, and who uh, purchase the fish from the traditional fishermen. 
And they in turn take the fish to the market and sell it to the local communities, or they prepare that fish to ship it out to other areas of West Africa and beyond. But because of the fact that there has increasingly become such a shortage of the types of fish that these women and the local fishermen themselves fish for, the prices have increased. So supply has gone down, the price has increased, such that um, the, try and find the number. So the typical number uh, or the typical price rather for um, a basket of these fish would be about $2. It's now increased to $10, which is beyond the reach of most of these women. That's how sizable uh, $10 is. If we go back to thinking about what the poverty level is and the numbers of people who live below $1.25 per day, we understand the scale and the scope of, of this crisis. Destruction of the coastline, uh, water, soil pollution, and worker health concerns have also been an important part of the conversation surrounding the fish processing, fish meal processing plants um, in the Gambia. Um, in 2017, an environmental group uh, contacted the local authority to co uh, complain about the plant, uh, the, excuse me, the trucks that were traveling to the plant uh, being turned away and then ultimately dumping uh, their fish that the plant would not purchase um, and leaving uh, fish carcasses along the roads. In addition to that, the fishermen themselves who come in, those who work within the plant, have complained of health problems, as have the children in the surrounding areas who have developed uh, chest infections and unexplained coughs. But perhaps most significant is the destruction environmentally that the plant um, is thought to have uh, created. So I want to show you a very brief video of uh, my last trip to the Gambia. Uh, what you see before you was a lagoon uh, up until about two years ago. And you can see uh, everything that you see around uh, in the image that I'm going to show you, the sanded areas, those were all lagoons or a part of the lagoon. And you'll see what remains. So this is uh, an area of the lagoon, what remains, and the water is completely red. Um, and it was circumstances like this that caused the National Environment Agency to file a lawsuit against Golden Lead. Um, this was in 2017. Um, and like uh, its counterparts in other areas of the country where lawsuits have been filed, it was settled out of court. Though we do have the documentation to prove what the amount was of the settlement. In this case, it was $25,000. So that was the price of destroying this lagoon. Um, beyond the image that you see there are still the leftover uh, lobster traps and crab traps uh, where people actually utilize this lagoon as a means of fishing, uh, both for their personal consumption and also uh, to sell to the local communities. So the question is, what can be done about this? Where should the Gambia go in terms of its relationship with the People's Republic of China? And my response is that it's complicated, as many things are. So the government continues displaying a soft spot for investors um, in what is interpreted as a way of cementing its relationship with China. 
So the example of uh, the fine for golden for golden lead of twenty five thousand dollars is a prime example of that. Um, and it does this as it seeks to boost earnings at a time when its economy is re really in a terrible state. But it's important to note that the Gambia is a part of the Belt and Road Initiative that's been championed by China, but also leaders and nations between China and Europe, as well as South America, as a way of breaking uh, the American hold on trade globally. As a part of its connection with the Belt and Road Initiative, the Chinese government has made a number of concessions to the Gambia. Um, it includes a $33 million uh, grant, part of which is scheduled to actually go toward developing the country's agriculture and fishing industries. The Chinese also canceled Gambia's national debt of $14 million. Thus the government is keen not to discourage foreign investors, especially from the Chinese. So that is all that I have for you today. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Mark. I mean, this is very enlightening. It's, yeah, yeah I see you, Martin, thank you. Uh, and I know the questions among us, the audience, but again, before we do that, I want to go back to the question that was raised in the chat by Dr. Efiong. I know he has left, where he was uh, he was commenting about, uh, was giving a, a response to the commenter I gave about, so is it hopeless? Do I mean to say that we, we don't have solutions to all these problems, these skewed relationships, this unfair relationship between Africa and China as it seems or as it stands today? Actually, no, maybe it, it came out wrong. Remember Tara, Dr. Mark right now said that the relationship is complicated. I had Paolo say, I don't really think I have enough answers to this. So what I was trying to respond to is that even when we feel that there's nothing much we can do, maybe as people, even in this forum, it's still important that we, we keep discussing this because uh, as he said, the colonial structures uh, the legacies in Africa, the colonial legacies in Africa, are, are actually make it even making it even more complicated. But the fact that we know we know what the problem is, we as the people even in this forum, we know what the problem is, and we know what the solution could be. But the fact that it's taking us long mm -hmm. to get these solutions into practice, or what we have in mind as people that we think would work into practice, is what I was uh, alluding to that even when it seems hopeless, even when we seem we're powerless, we know what we're supposed to do, but we're not doing it. The what, the, the, the we are not doing it part is what I was actually trying to comment about that. Um, we shouldn't feel that, why, why are we even here talking about China, Africa? What are we going to do about it? Sometimes we feel like that if we leave this discussion and we didn't pinpoint one single thing that we're going to do as a people, then our questions would be like, why are we even discussing this? We're discussing this because we know, as he said, that of course, colonialism has a big part to play in what's dwindling the, the progress in Africa in so many ways. And we know what we can do as people, we know what leaders can do as the people, but it's, it's taking us long to do it. So, so let's keep talking about it. As Lutandila said, um, the young people maybe are going to take the world by storm, we, we, we might be seeing a, a different Africa, a different world, given that we're getting more knowledgeable. We're talking about these uh, discussions in, in, in academia, outside academia, in the public. So basically that's what I wanted to respond to that. Uh, it's not as if it's hopeless or we don't know what to do, but why we're not doing it is, is what I want to speak into onto that. Let's keep talking about it. We 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 will have answers if it's not today. So thank you so much. I don't want to take so much time because I want people to engage. Please, if you're able to, you can unmute yourself. You can raise your hand. You can add a question. I see something in the chat. You can add a question on the chat. 
so I'll begin with with the please. I I I as I said, feel free to to raise your hand or or or, or unmute yourself and and speak so we can give you a chance to talk. Maxine is asking, how has COVID impacted tourism? And I think this is in the in the Gambia. I don't know if you are asking in Ovro, but maybe in the Gambia because that's our most recent discussion. So, Dr. Mark, if you can respond to this. Um, well, I don't have specific figures, but uh, anecdotally, based upon uh, individuals who are still there and my connection with some who are uh, more closely related to what's happening on the ground right now, I can say that tourism has come to a stop. Um, and that has been uh, since the early part of last year. Thus, it provides an indication of just how dire the circumstances likely are on the ground there at this particular moment, given the fact that it's a country whose inhabitants are so heavily reliant on the tourist industry for survival. And I want to, I know that this question wasn't posed for me, but I do want to just add um, just a bit of anecdote regarding this question of hopelessness um, based on um, this ganjur example. So this work in the ganjur is not in ganjur is not something that I went looking for. I was there doing the work that I normally do there, uh, working on a project that I've been working on for a number of years, and the fishermen sought me out. So they are actually directing attention to what's happening in their community themselves. And I'm not the only one. There are stories being written about this community, about Golden Lead um, in a number of major uh, uh, papers across the, country, uh, across the continent. So they themselves are uh, using their agency to draw attention to this because they are very clear about what they want. They feel that the government has made a bad deal for them, especially given the fact that whenever, um, whenever there are complaints, especially environmentally, regarding the methods that these uh, fish mill processing plant plants are used, the government has been um, easily swayed in the favor of these processing plants. Um, there have been a number, there's a recent court case that was actually filed a few years ago. And typically um, $25,000 was a, a hefty fine. Uh, many of them have been about $10,000, $5,000. So these plants shut down for a short period of time and then they reopen. Um, one of the complaints about uh, Golden Lead regarding the, the lagoon, and it's difficult to see it given the, um, given the a way that the uh, video that I showed, uh, uh, given the video that I showed, but the lagoon is basically here. There's golden lead and there is a village and then this is the ocean. And so what's happening is that uh, the uh, effusal, the refuse is going out of the plant into the ocean, but, be, but it doesn't actually reach the ocean because the, um, the piping is short. And so it's actually just sitting on the beach. And so there's a lot of fish waste uh, that's actually polluting the beach area. And this is where people live. They don't simply fish there, but these are individuals who have lived here for generations if not centuries. And so they are deeply vested in uh, removing these plants from their communities. And in cases where they have not felt heard, they have actually, um, they tried to take the law into their own hands in certain ways. So there have been a number of, um, of uh, altercations of, of various forms between these, these two groups. So, so yeah, thank you so much actually for adding your comments on, on the question that I just responded and the question that was added on the chat because see, we now know that there's urgency. 
in the Gambia, especially in the case study that, that you, you discussed. So that's why I say when, when we talk about these things, we get enlightened. And perhaps now we might start thinking about how can local communities, the communities or the civilians that are impacted by, by these relationships, by these collaborations, what, what, where should we start? Perhaps we should be, be focusing on the people than mm -hmm. the leadership. Is there things that we can do from the grassroots instead of focusing from the top down leadership that, as most of us know, has failed the people in different countries? So thank you so much, Dr. Mark, for adding that. There's a question here from Paolo. Give me a second. Uh, it says, Dr. Mock, to what extent should African economies balance economic growth to environmental protection, given that the current models of economic development often lead to environmental degradation? I think that's a great question. I wish that I were the one to respond to it. Um, I don't do a great deal of work in terms of the environment. I uh, My work really focuses on the more social impacts of this relationship. Um, it, it, one of the things that I find most curious about this particular uh, case is the fact that uh, the government appears to be allowing the, allowing the environment to be polluted um, in exchange for gaining financial resources that are then supposed to be put into shoring up um, this industry. And it seems counterintuitive. You already have these natural resources that um, require some sort of economic support, but now in order for them to really thrive, it will require additional um, financial support. Um, so I'm, I'm not quite certain what the environmental solution might be. I know that there are a number of environmental scientists who are on the ground in Gunjur who are working um, on this particular case. Um, and, uh, there's one in particular who is a Gambian, but who actually lives outside of the Gambia. Um, um, and he's actually traveled back home to focus on this. So this is something that people are actually paying closer attention to as more learn about the effects of these fish meal processing plants. Oh, well. oh, thank you. And this seems to be a follow-up question from Paolo. Dr. Jonathan Chot, I'm going to come back to your question. I'm not sure if I captured this in your presentation. Is there an EPA in the Gambia? What environmental policies are in place to hold polluters accountable? There, um, I don't recall the name of the agency, but there is one in place in the Gambia. Um, and I was fortunate to actually um, have half a day with um, a few of their um, uh, representatives. And one of the things that we talked about were these complaints and how they were trying to mitigate the dangers. So from their perspectives, um, these aren't really uh, dangerous for the, the local populations. And they use the example of another golden lead plant that was operating in a, a different African nation. And to make their determinations regarding whether or not golden lead should be allowed to operate in the Gambia, they brought them to another country they had them to visit um, that plant and I've seen all of the images of it. Um, and so things seem to be done um, in a far better uh, manner than they were being done in the Gambia. And part of it has to do with the regulatory environment. The other nation that the other Golden Lead plant is operating in um, boasts a far more significant level of development than the Gambia, but also far more significant um, and capable monitoring resources than the Gambia currently has. Okay, thank you Dr. Mark for that response. I, I have a question here from Dr. Choti Jonathan Nyabuto. That's 
what he goes by recently I see. But the, the, I think it, it's an overall question. I, I, I see it's focused on Gambia, Africa, but generally I probably think he's trying to ask a question as an ex, uh, you're an expert in Africa-China relationship. So he's asking, do you think China is in the Gambia or Africa generally to develop or destroy the country, the continent? Please explain. What do you think as somebody who has done these studies? In, in... I, again, it's complex. So if you look at the historical relations between um, Chinese people and African um, nations, particularly um, uh, nations along the Eastern coastline of Africa, there were certain solidarities that developed, especially following the Bandung Conference, which is something that we hear reference often surrounding this relationship. Um, and so we know that much of the relationship developed around these ideas of friendship and solidarity and brotherhood, but the sort of brotherhood that goes along with socialism. Um, but what's happened since that time is that although the Chinese um, continue to operate as a communist country, it's very much so um, a realist, as uh, I think Paul has mentioned, uh, Paulo mentioned, um, capitalism, capitalist minded uh, socialist country. And so while I do not think that they are there with the intent of uh, destroying Africa, it's very clear that they are there to pursue their own interest. Um, and in doing so, it may not matter as much if a nation is not in a position to protect its own interests to the Chinese, because from their perspective and likely from the perspective of many other world leaders, nations should look out for their own best interest. And thus, if they're allowed to go into the Gambia and make um, inequitable deals, if they're allowed to pollute the environment, um, then that is uh, the responsibility of the local leadership and not the Chinese from their perspective. Um, and so, as I said, I think it's certainly complicated, um, but I would not classify it as being uh, that they are directly there because they want to destroy um, the African nations. Well, I think that there are various ways that the African nation can be destroyed without overtly uh, attempting to destroy it. As an example, uh, both scholars mentioned the fact that there's conflict between the Africans themselves. And given this conflict, uh, decisions have been made relative to who should get the support of the uh, Chinese, whether in Angola or in the Gambia. Mm -hmm. And remember that their vested interest, as you call it, uh, is to see to it that those interests are maintained the only way that it's really going to uh, change is that the people will rise up. You can't defy the laws of physics there. If the body at rest is going to remain there until it's acted upon by an outside force. And so uh, in the case of Ganja, uh, the local people have been uh, fighting with the government, the Gambian government uh, personnel. Uh, why? Because the Gambian government personnel made the agreement with the uh, Chinese people and they're there to protect the Chinese people. The same sort of thing was alluded to in terms of Angola. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Mark. I, I think that that's what perhaps all this discussion has been revolving around that um, the people are, are major players in, in this either relationship or conflicts or because our leadership generally, if, if, if we can't rely on the leadership, then the will of the people has to be, you know, responded to in some way. And the people themselves, it's, it's kind of like when we have the politics of elections and things like that, most of the time, 
countries where the people, the, the youth, like Benin is what I keep giving as an example, where the youth actually hold the leadership responsible, you seem to see a difference than where the, the, the people are waiting on the government to, to, to effect everything. So somehow what I'm seeing, the trend I'm seeing here is that uh, the voices of the people or the, the, the power of the people has to rule for, for any meaningful change to, to happen. I see two hands raised. I see Jonathan's. I don't know if there's another hand that I missed, but Nyabutochot, you can go ahead and then I'll see who else has the hand up. Uh, uh, thank you both, uh, Dr. Mock and uh, Paolo for the nice talks. Uh, I want to make a comment um, based on actually from, based on the two uh, presentations. It's very clear that uh, it's very clear that the relationships uh, or the relationship China has with the Angola and the, the Gambia uh, could be the Chinese want to support the African people in those places. Uh, but uh, their intentions, uh, as you put it, Tara, is like they are out there to, to preserve to, for their interests there as a country, as a people. But uh, at the same time, they are doing this without less care about the people, their collaborators. It's like the relationship is secured against the African. And they know that in terms of the, uh, the capital, in terms of the knowledge and the skills they have, like for, for the fish, like for the fish plant, they have put out the, uh, in Gambia. If you go to assist somebody and as a partner, you wanna participate in drafting the agreement you have to have their interest as well uh, if you are going to help them. But if you don't want, you're going to take advantage because we are coming from different backgrounds. So China knows where Africa is coming from. And they, they, so they take advantage of that to disadvantage the African people and the African nations. So that's where my problem is. We can still have bilateral relationships across the globe, but still, uh, but still we be good uh, in the relation that we do our business, we take our profits home and leave those people, their environment taken care of, their people fighting their uh, uh, poverty. Uh, you're not going to just kill their fish, kill their environment and they don't and they pay $25,000. That's really, that's really absurd. Uh, that's really absurd. I have so much to talk about that, but I think I want to stop here and highlight the fact that we can have good relationships at a, a country level, at whatever level, and uh, with those who have more, you can harvest more, but still you don't have to destroy all or to, uh, to, to, to take more that you can, is necessary, or destroy in the process. That's really what I wanted to say. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nyabuto. And then I have Delile Langeni, and uh, please go ahead. You can unmute yourself. and. Uh, the reason why I really wanted to join because I saw Chinese and um, I want to echo what Dr. Cho, he, my son, <laughs> what he said, why I joined, I wanted to listen because I'm from South Africa. So usually I go home, I'm in Michigan. Uh, when I go home, I find out that South Africa is full of Chinese people, who are selling things, I, I, I appreciate that. But I feel like there's also some exploitation there. Number one, what they pay for mostly black people, young men there, is really nothing. And even the way how they treat them, you can see. And I just think like they're there for their own good. And when they come, they promise they're going to make business and hire the locals. No. After that, they bring their relatives, friends, and all that. Go to Johannesburg area. All the buildings are Chinese. So I feel like uh, what I understand, what you guys you were giving, uh, Dr. Mark and Dr. Um, Paulo, I feel like uh, I didn't get much that they are trying to do that, but I'm praying that they are not getting there to end up 
playing that game of bringing their own families. And thank you so much for bringing that information. But I'm glad that I have to express my observation from my own country. Thank you. Well, well thank you for sharing that. I also work within South Africa. It's one of the countries that I focus on. Um, and I can tell you that um, the experience that you re recounted isn't unusual. Um, one of the most significant complaints surrounding the relationship has been the, about employment. So as I mentioned in this small case study, there was a promise of bringing, um, of hiring a certain number of locals, hiring locals. Um, but when it all uh, was said and done, the numbers were very small. And that's merely a very small uh, example of what's happened across the continent, even when we think about these larger um, infrastructure deals, uh, deals to build the uh, AU headquarters, um, deals to build uh, dams and hydroelectric dams in Ghana and bridges across the continent. Many of those have been, and even in, um, Kenya in 2016, the Madaraka Express. I mean, those are China-led uh, infrastructure projects. And many of them um, historically were built, they were constructed by Chinese citizens who were brought over. So one of the problems is that you uh, these uh, governments would enter into relationships or enter into agreements with the Chinese government whereby they would um, take out loans for to pay for these uh, infrastructure projects. And the loans themselves were guaranteed by certain types of natural resources. So now you're guaranteeing this present uh, equipment with your, your country's future wealth. But one of the problems with that is that you're taking out the loan and then the loan is used to purchase Chinese uh, stock. So they're bringing over components of the bridges, of the buildings um, and all of those things. They're purchasing from Chinese businesses. And as a result, those businesses continue to develop but the local industry does not as a result. In addition to that, they were bringing over uh, Chinese workers. And the thinking was that these are workers who are accustomed to working hard. They're accustomed to working long. Um, and so they would supplement the Chinese uh, employment patterns with certain numbers of local workers. But it hasn't been very long within the last 10 years or so, um, especially surrounding issues in Zambia, but also um, Angola, I believe, is one of those spaces where there were a lot of complaints surrounding the treatment of these Chinese bosses um, toward the local workers who, at, up to that point, had been uh, fairly low-skilled workers. Uh, they would not hire them in managerial positions or senior management positions. But given the negative press surrounding uh, what happened in Zambia in particular, what has occurred is that um, the governments have started to broker deals, at least in this respect, that factor in um, local employment levels. That's one of the reasons why this Gambian deal is such a surprise, because they have been very careful to be responsive to the complaints of locals regarding um, the uh, immigration of so many Chinese when there are locals who could very easily be working. Um, so uh, South Africa is a unique circumstance uh, given the fact that um, you have to question which Chinese are you referring to because uh, there's a Chinese diaspora of old, there's a more recent Chinese diaspora, but um, the circumstance that you are describing isn't um, unique to South Africa. Thank you so very much. I know we've run out of time, but I'll give this time to Maxine. Her hand has been up. No, you don't have to because it'll be a long, long thing, but I, and I have to leave too. Okay. I'll, I'll skip my questions the next time. 
Thank you. Very or, much. or maybe you you can you can actually uh, connect with Tara or Paolo. Later, okay. I can I can connect you with them later, so you can okay. you can have more discussion on that. But I, I'm sorry, your your heart was up, but I didn't see it. It was behind the mask. I know it was the decoration <laughs> behind the house. So I know. Otherwise, I want us to end here. But before we do, I say thank you so very much for being with us, staying with us until the end. But the most I'm most thankful for for the presenters, Dr. Mock and and, and Paolo. I think he has left for. The, the wonderful discussion that you've uh, helped us, you know, have this this afternoon because it definitely needs some some expert knowledge to be able to discuss this. Because as people, as as uh, Mama Delilia already mentioned, we see the problem on the ground, but definitely it's deeper than that. And uh, thank you so much for giving us your perspective on this and the questions that have been asked. Actually, have also helped us think deeper, think wider. But for me, a takeaway as a person is that uh, definitely trying to maybe sensitize our people about rights, about what, what they need to do as people, their urgency, as you say, it's most important for now. It might not be like a long-term solution, but I probably think that's where we need to begin because the question comes back with all these questions like, who drafts this agreement that I skewed in the first place? Or if you make a mistake and draft them, and you see things are not working as you drafted them. There's nothing you can do as a government, for example. So I think it keeps going back to how do, do the Chinese even get to Africa in the first place? If they do and the agreement maybe was drafted right, but the results are, are, are wrong or negative, why aren't we doing anything? How do we get so involved that we can't stand back and say, this is not what we agreed on. So, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a deeper discussion that we can have and we can have more time maybe in the future to continue this conversation. But I definitely want to thank you so much for leading the discussion this evening. I know Eben was supposed to lead us out, but then the internet didn't work. Eben, are you here? Do you have any concluding thoughts? Um. No, unfortunately, or fortunately, getting to the latter part now, the internet is a bit stable. Mm -hmm. Thanks for holding it down. Um, and thank you to Tara and Paolo. Tara, good to see you. You also, my pleasure. Okay, other than that, that I want to well, now say that the meeting is over, but if people want to stick around, maybe hang out a little bit, I'll be the last person to leave. But thanks everyone for joining.